another episode on our channel here. I'm Dr. Nasser, internal medicine attending hospitalist uh, started in the state of Florida. I have uh, another episode of our morbidity and mortality. I think the previous episode, we talked about aortic dissection, and that was a real missed case that we went through. So this one is going to be the ectopic pregnancy, a very important diagnosis um, that continues to get missed. And this is a real case that happened in India. So let's go over it. So there's more text that I'm going to talk about on the slides. You can stop the representation and always read all that. So let's go ahead. This is, I have nothing to disclose. This is completely by myself and a case review. All right. So this was a 25 year old. She was married for two years. She was a mother of an 11 month old male child. She had a previous C-section and delivery and she was actively breastfeeding. Now on the evening of the day that this patient passed, she had a sudden onset of severe abdominal pain and discomfort. She treated herself with over-the-counter medications, temporary relief of pain. At midnight, her pain was severely worse and became unbearable, rushed to the hospital, and the outcome was that the patient was declared dead on arrival. Now, very important. The issue here, the critical diagnostic pitfall, the patient experiences lactational amenorrhea, right? So meaning she had not resumed menstrual period since childbirth 11 months prior to that. She was actively breastfeeding her infant and most likely assumed that she could not become pregnant during this period. And this is very important. The assumption that lactation or amoria provides reliable contraception, it's one of the biggest and most dangerous misconceptions. And breastfeeding women can and do become pregnant. And healthcare providers must maintain vigilance for pregnancy-related complications in this specific population. So let's go over this. So they autopsied the body of this patient. They found that she had 2.2 liters of fluid and clotted blood in her peritoneal cavity. The right fallopian tube was markedly enlarged, one centimeter by one centimeter rupture on the anterior aspect. The gestational findings were there was a sac that was four by two centimeters and the embryo was two centimeters or one centimeter with visible eyes, a mouth cleft. And the cause of death in this patient was hemorrhagic shock, secondary to a ruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy. So we need to educate ourselves and our patients on this. Now, lactation or amenorrhea method, or LAM, requires three things. Even then, it's still 2% chance that this could fail. Now, LAM is considered only effective when all of these three criteria are met. First one, infant age is less than six months old. Two, feeding pattern is exclusive breastfeeding on demand day and night. And three, the menstrual status. There's no return of menstrual periods. But again, remember, even under ideal conditions, LAM or LAM has approximately 2% failure rate in the first six months postpartum. In this case, a patient, the infant was 11 month old, so she already failed that criteria. Just know that while elevated prolactin levels from breastfeeding do suppress ovulation, many women, this effect is highly variable and unreliable after six months postpartum. So we must counsel all postpartum women about contraception options, pregnancy risks, regardless of their breastfeeding status. So why ectopic pregnancies are lethal really goes to the anatomic limitation of the fallopian tube diameter, which is only one to four millimeters in the nearest portion. So imagine as the gestational sac continues to grow and get bigger, you are dealing with a fallopian tube that basically lacks the muscular wall and the vascular capacity of the uterus to accommodate that growing pregnancy and that progression. And about 6 to 16 weeks gestation can lead to eventual rupture. And because you have a lot of vascular supply in the pelvis, you could have a rapid massive intraperitoneal bleed that basically could kill you within hours. And this is unlike the uterine bleeding, with this ruptured ectopic pregnancy cannot be temporized with medical management 
and it needs immediate surgical intervention to be done. But major risk factors, just know that the classic triad that we learn on USMLE, abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and menorrhea, is only 50% of the time it, that patient presents with that. So before rupture, you may have abdominal pain a lot of times, vaginal bleeding, amenorrhea, and these are all, again, per, by percentage. Not everyone is going to have this. After you're in hypovolemic shock, it could be, depending on the time from the, of the rupture, the vessel involved, in shoulder pain, syncope, all these things. But the, one of the highest risk factors for ectopic pregnancy is a previous ectopic pregnancy. Remember, a lot of times on boards they do this. What is the biggest risk factor of something? That previous history of that something. So in this case, 10 to 25% recurrence. PID, azichlamydia, gonorrhea, these cause damaging to the tubes and increase the risk of basically another an episode of ectopic pregnancy. Prior tubal surgery, again, significant elevation in the risk uh, of this. Moderate risk factors are smoking, advanced Asian endometriosis, IUD being in place. But 50% of women with ectopic pregnancy have no identifiable risk factors. So just remember, this is a very important diagnosis and we don't want to miss. Now, the diagnostic approach, I'm not. this is not really a lecture on this, but the diagnostic approach, we do the serial beta HCG testing, and we have expectations in the rise of this beta HCG. And if it's abnormal, we need to start thinking about it. A transvaginal ultrasound is very important to look for it and see where the embryo or the yolk sac is. And one thing that I want to talk about is pregnancy of unknown location. So when you have a positive pregnancy test, but no visible pregnancy or ultrasound, which can happen 8 to 31% of women within the first trimester that have some pain and bleeding, this is very important. If you get this on the, in hospital or in your clinic, but just remember, if you're sending this patient home with PUL, do not send them without a robust follow-up plan and continue that workup until you make the definitive diagnosis. Now, this is, again, things you should know. Medical management, the methotrexate there for when you can do, depending on the time that you cash this, 70 to 95% success. Surgical management, again, 100% success, but you need to be ready to take this patient in right away to surgery if this is indicated. And the emergency, critical indications to think about, rupture with massive hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, all the things we talked about, emergency laparotomy for rapid hemorrhage, a lot of resuscitation, and being very time sensitive. So early diagnosis really expands treatment options and reduces the morbidity and mortality. The goal is to diagnose and treat before it happens. But again, a lot of misdiagnoses, when something goes missing, is usually a mix of things. There are cognitive errors, there are system failures, the cognitive issues being anchoring on diagnoses for abdominal pain, premature closure, just saying, oh, it pro probably an ovarian cyst and, and then just discharging patient availability, things that happen most commonly, like a right side being appendicitis, a search satisfying, thinking about one plausible explanation is found and you just uh, stick with that. And system issues, no follow-up tracking. Remember PUL, we want to have follow-up tracking with these patients. Communication breakdowns, so maybe some information is lost a poor communication between the ED and patient clinicians. Inadequate discharge instructions, very important. More than admitting a patient in general is how you discharge them after that admission. Lack of a standardized protocols for PULs. A lot of systems lack this. Uh, very important to take into account. Now, prevention through clinical vigilance and patient education. Again, uh, seeking care immediately if you have those symptoms. Education verbal and written, teach back method, very important, ask the patient to repeat what you tell them, and include their family, take this very seriously, and a multi-layered approach is always the best. The individual clinical vigilance, the team communication, institutional systems, and patient empowerment can save lives. This is an important part of larger crisis of women's healthcare, 32.6 per 100,000 cases of U.S. maternal mortality rate and 2.7% of pregnancy-related deaths, and two to three times higher maternal mortality among the black women compared to the white women. 80% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. 
just think about that and very important to think about these systemic failures in maternal health care ectopic pregnancy deaths are examples of these failures preventable with early diagnosis is still claiming lives due to system level breakdowns and screening follow-up and patient education a fragmented kind of care lack the continuity you have prenatal you have emergency you have postpartum access barriers the insurance gaps geographic disparities provider shortages implicit biases in racial and socioeconomic disparities to think about and postpartum neglect limited follow-up after delivery leaves women vulnerable to these complications but every death is preventable guys we have the diagnostic tool we have the clinical knowledge the treatment options to prevent this from ectopic pregnancy so maintain that high clinical suspicion consider it in every woman of reproductive age with abdominal pain I use diagnostic protocols, the stereo beta, ACGs, the transvaginal ultrasound until you find a definitive diagnosis. Ensure a robust follow-up, systematic tracking of the PULs, positive pregnancies of unknown location with institutional accountability and educate every patient. Use the teach back method. This was a 25-year-old mother. She deserved better. Every patient deserves a better healthcare system that prioritizes their safety over how fast and convenient it is thank you so much guys for being here if you stay to the end of the video please comment subscribe i spend a lot of time on these videos make sure that they're highly educational and things that can happen in everyday life if you're a practicing physician in the u.s you want to always remain vigilant keep your medical knowledge updated and always be on top of the topics so i'll see you guys on the next episode i hope you enjoyed it i'll be back with more content